I don't know if you guys can hear this, but uh, directly downstairs, my mother is blasting the Beastie Boys. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to my channel where I cover nostalgic, obscure, or otherwise strange content. Today, we are returning to a fan favorite thing on this channel. It is Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction. This show, I started covering it really early on in the channel, like really early on, and I did not think anybody else would care about it the way that I do, and every time I would cover an episode, people immediately want me to cover more episodes. And I don't think this cycle will end until one day I have covered all 46 episodes of Beyond Belief, which it feels like there should be more because there's like five stories in each episode, but there's only 46 episodes. But I believe this is the ninth episode we've talked about on this channel. Um, I'm sure that you guys all know the dealio with Beyond Belief. Why did I just say dealio? Anyway, Beyond Belief tells you five short stories. You've got to guess which ones are real and which ones are fake, and you can never guess because you have to throw logic all the way out the window. The show is designed to make you go, huh? <laughs> this episode is season three, episode one. It was requested for the short story entitled Blood Bank. If you know, you know, but, um, I'm, uh, gonna cover all five stories, obviously the whole episode, so let's just jump into it. Is the truth always easy to see? Not watching this show, it's not. Take this picture. Viewed from this angle, it appears to be a dramatic seascape. Oh, it's a pretty painting. Take this vase, place it on the picture. It's a pretty painting with a vase on it? The clear reflection of a man with a beard. Oh, I see, it's an optical illusion. It happens to be the face of legendary science fiction writer Jules Verne. That's pretty cool. Tonight you will see stories that may be inspired by actual events, or they may be clever lies. A fact which should give you pause for reflection. Jonathan Frakes loves black suits, and he loves dad jokes. <laughs> they come in strips, sticks, tubes, and kits. Today's home pregnancy tests are available everywhere and can be purchased right alongside the beer and potato chips. Pregnancy tests really do resemble uh, COVID test strips, don't they? Like the rapid at-home ones? Like, not exactly, but you know what I mean? First thing I thought of was COVID tests. If you've got a uterus and you're living post-pandemic, you've got several kinds of tests that could uh, freak you out. Take 18-year-old Marissa Baker. Her body is starting to feel different these days. All right, story one is called Morning Sickness. Oh my God, why? Right off the bat, with the, with the porcelain doll. Our daughter Marissa had just graduated from high school that June. My husband Glenn and I were beginning to suspect that she had gotten herself into a bad situation. Okay, so this episode is about a teenager who is afraid that she is pregnant. I mean, I've honestly woken up like that just on my period. Marissa, what's wrong? <coughs> oh, she's, so she's throwing up, so they think she has morning sickness, so they're worried that that's what it is. It's her stomach again, isn't it? This has been going on for three weeks now. It can't be the flu. Oh, Glenn, we both know what it is. We just don't want to face it. Okay, but I'm gonna just say right now, I'm not a parent, I've never been in this situation, but maybe don't scream about your disappointment in your child while she's throwing up right on the other side of the door where she can hear. But she's gonna have to talk to us about this. Glenn, let me do it. You're getting upset. Yeah, you're both getting upset. Your getting upset is not special, Mom. I'm not pregnant. Whoop, very close up shot, just so that we know how serious she is. If there's anything you want to talk there's about. There's nothing to talk about, Mom. I'm not pregnant. So they're like, are you sure you're not pregnant? She's like, I'm sure I'm not pregnant. As the days passed, Marissa began to have strange cravings. Again, this is just kind of a mood, just like, you know, sometimes you just want snackies. I mean, I'm sure it's not going to be as simple as that, because this is an episode of Beyond Belief, but you know, benefit of the doubt. Ooh, that is a baby bump. I gotta say, that is a severe uh, baby bump. You and Jason made a mistake. I know what it does look like, but it's impossible. So she breaks down with her parents and she's like, look, I can't be pregnant because, you know, certain things have to happen before somebody gets pregnant that haven't happened yet. So, you know, give me a pregnancy test. I'll prove it. You can give me a whole pregnancy test. Yeah, you know, sometimes when I do these videos, I feel like the internet's like older sister or aunt or something. I have never felt more like that than right now. I feel dangerously close to the talk and I, it's just, I, for my sanity and for monetization reasons, we're just gonna keep it surface level. Well, according to this, you're not pregnant. 
And what do you know, the test is negative. She's not pregnant. Should have believed her, Mom and Dad. Oh, what's wrong? Something moved. Well, oh, what? I'm so confused, though, because the, I, hmm. I don't want to alarm you, but it looks like a large cyst. The doctor thinks that she has some kind of cyst in her stomach, which is making her feel pregnant? What about the movement I was feeling? Oh, that was probably a muscle spasm. This is horrifying. Well, I recommend that we go in and remove it as quickly as possible. All right, so they rush her into surgery, and the doctor's like, eh, you'll be fine. Is she going to be all right? Marissa's a strong young woman. Whatever it is, recovery will be quick. Shout out to doctors for, like, doing, like, a seriously important job and, like, staying calm when they see, like, the most horrible things. But sometimes, occasionally, I'll get a doctor, I've had doctors in the past, that just do not seem to take my feelings into consideration at all. And it's just like, okay, I know that this isn't a big deal for you because you're you've been through medical school, but this is terrifying for me. Don't tell me that it's no big deal. Okay, scalpel. Oh, I don't want to see a surgery. I don't want to see something about like gore in TV shows and movies, like horror movies, slasher movies. I don't, that doesn't bother me nearly as much as like the medical drama scenes. And I'm not sure why that is. I think it's because it feels more real, you know? Although one thing I got really good at when uh, me and my filmmaking crew formed and we started making films was I got really good at making various kinds of fake movie blood. You know how to mix it um, and, and get like the different like stages of blood depending on how like new you want the blood to be. Sorry if you're squeamish. I don't mean to, I don't mean to freak you out. I'm not gonna show any pictures. Whoa, that's strange. It feels like it's moving. Uh-oh, tumors don't tend to move, so what the hell's happening? Oh my god. Doctor, what is it? Oh my god. It's a baby octopus. What? <laughs> Marissa had been spending a lot of time swimming in the ocean that summer. What? <laughs> she must have swallowed a fertilized octopus egg, and her body provided the incubator for its development. What the fuck? She incubated a baby octopus? That, hmm. This feels like an episode of Urban Legends. I know you guys talk to me a lot about, um, you want me to start covering episodes of that other show that was a few years after Beyond Belief that's basically the same or similar format, but it's with Urban Legends specifically, like popular Urban Legends, and this feels like one of them. This feels very Urban Legendy. But let's be clear about one thing. No one is claiming that Marissa gave birth to an octopus. Cause like, it's a different species. It's a cold-blooded spe- I have- mm, I have so many questions. The story you've just seen was suppressed for years and is still denied by the medical community. Spoken like a true conspiracy theorist. This story was being suppressed for years and is denied by the medical community. I'm not saying that Jonathan Frakes himself is saying that, but you know how that sentence just kind of sounds like your, like, crazy aunt on Facebook being like, they're putting microchips in the vaccine! This video is gonna get demonetized anyway, let's just commit. Can this really be possible? Can a fertilized octopus egg ingested into the human system actually grow inside the body? I hope that's not true. Next, a real estate agent sells a house with a curse on Beyond Belief. Have you noticed what big stars real estate agents have become? Um, I mean, the Property Brothers are pretty big. They're not realtors, though, I don't think. I went through a whole HGTV phase a few years back. Bev isn't working without a net. She's working without a conscience. A sad number of people do in life, okay. All right, story number two, The Curse of Hampton Manor. Sounds like the name of a Nancy Drew book. I'd never met a woman like Bev Conklin before. I wish I never had. Is that street legal? I don't think you can just have dollar signs as your vanity plate. You've gotta, can you? Does somebody have that? I feel like that's not legal. But the manor was cursed. All five previous owners had met with horrible misfortune. All right, so Hotshot Realtor is going to try to sell a haunted, cursed manor where the last five owners have died. Very scary. I guess she might be a real estate agent because realtor is like a brand thing, like, right? I, I don't know, I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure realtor is a brand. I can't get over the fabulous deal you got us, Bev. <laughs> I keep thinking, there has to be something wrong with the old place. They got such a good deal, they're just like, something isn't right here. But you know what? In this economy, we're gonna let it slide. I envy you both. I just wish I could afford a home like Hampton Manor. 
The kind of commission that this lady must be making with the kind of property she's selling, she definitely could afford to live there. Drive safe now. Yes. 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 The happy dance. I just can't believe you didn't tell those people about the curse of Hampton Manor. The forced dialogue. I can't believe you didn't tell those owners about the curse at Hampton Manor where five other people died. I can't believe you. I just think you should have said something. There's nothing in the real estate code of ethics that says anything about divulging dumb superstitions to potential buyers. So her assistant has a bigger conscience than she does. I don't know. Do consciences have sizes? Is it like the Grinch's heart? Two sizes too small? Anyway. I didn't see Bev Conklin again for almost six months. <laughs> six months later, uh, she gets visited again by the owners of the house who are aging rapidly like they've become the president. Ever since I took ownership of Hampton Manor, my life has gone to ruin. Oh, this poor guy. What had happened? All my stocks and bonds collapsed. My clients abandoned me. My wife left me for another man. Oh my god. I feel so bad. And I've developed a bleeding ulcer that causes me constant pain. All in a matter of six months? I finally learned from the neighbors about the curse of Hampton Manor. Oh, that really? Why? Why didn't you tell me about it before you sold it to me? It's so melodramatic. And I would also be melodramatic in this situation, but he's like, why? Why? I, I want the manor sold immediately. It has to be done today, immediately. If I own that house a moment longer, I know. I'll die. So he's like, you have to sell this house and you have to sell it right now or I'm going to die. You'd let it go for three hundred thousand. I'd be glad to take it off your hands today. But that's less than half of what I paid for it. I was gonna say three hundred k for that manor. I mean, I didn't get a good look at it, but they're calling it a manor. Three hundred k? That's nothing. I signed over the deed, making Bev Conklin the owner of Hampton Manor. Oh, but now the shady real estate agent is the new owner, so you know what that means. I never saw Bev again, but her assistant, Gina definitely believed in the curse. Told me the rest of the story. That poor assistant needs a new job. Bev, don't you feel weird about poor Mr. Mako? Why should I? He's completely nuts. The place is great. So that night, she's chilling out in the manor. I guess she just impromptu moved in. I thought she was just buying it off of his hands as like a business negotiation, but she like lives there now. Aren't you scared? I told you, I haven't had one single problem. By the way, people in TV and movies when they take bubble baths use a lot of bubbles. For sensor reasons, I'm sure, but have you ever used that many bubbles? I've never used that many bubbles in a bubble bath. Oh, will you stop already? Oh, no, 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 This is like a, this is like a lifelong fear. I don't even shower when it's raining outside because I'm afraid that some kind of freak electrical accident is gonna happen. No! Oh my god, no! <laughs> the hair! Oh god! <laughs> and that's it, that's the story. She died. Did Hampton Manor really have a curse? I don't know, Jonathan Frakes, I'm scared. We've changed the name and location of Hampton Manor for story purposes. But the home we based it on had a similar curse. Wait, but you're not supposed to tell us that until the ending, are you, Jonathan? You usually don't tell us that until the end. Their empire crumbled and dissolved. Their names, Harry and Leona Helmsley. We'll tell you whether this story is true or false. But didn't you just tell- okay. It feels like you just tried to tell us. So was that a fake out? I'm gonna have nightmares tonight and you're playing games with me. You're playing mind games with us, Jonathan Frakes. Of all the instruments of capital punishment, surely the most fiendish is the guillotine. Oh God. So I've been uh, streaming my way through playing all of the Nancy Drew PC games live on this channel. In fact, I'm gonna be going live shortly after I finish filming this video. Um, but a few nights ago, we were playing the fourth game in the series, which is about um, Marie Antoinette. So like, obviously the the guillotine comes up, unfortunately, and so, like, I I was trying to say in the least graphic way possible something about the demise of Marie Antoinette, and I must have not done a very good job because my ads were listed as limited at, on the VOD after that stream was done, and it, like, fixed itself out, but I was like, playing a Nancy Drew PC game, guys. I know that it's, like, gruesome, but, like, I, was it because of the whole guillotine thing? I guess we'll know if this video also gets limited ads, although, again, demonetized, for sure. The result? 
a dramatic slice of life. You did not just call a guillotine the slice of life. Pierre Saint-Jacques is a student of history. As a creator of wax figures, he has to be. Story number three is called Wax Executioner. Whether they're duplicating movie sets or famous moments from history, the attention to detail is legendary. Down to the last bolt. That is pretty cool. I'm pretty open about uh, how wax figures are kind of in that doll category. I tend to not like them, but the movie monster recreations are pretty, uh, pretty neat. The only one who could tolerate his high-strung behavior was his loyal brother. Well, yeah, that's what working with your siblings is for. I make movies with my brother, and we, we, we have to put up with each other's eccentricities just like we have had to do our entire life, so, you know, it works out. <laughs> This is the exact duplicate of the blade that separated poor Marie Antoinette's head from her body. Oh god, this is so... I'm gonna have nightmares. I, every single one of these stories has, like, hit a core fear with me. <laughs> also, Marie Antoinette was, like, barely 18 when she died. Like, that's so tragic. Like, down with the bourgeoisie, I get all that, but, like, ooh, yikes. Yikes, yikes, yikes. Do you really think the public cares if it's real or not? I care, and that's all that matters. He's like, I'll know it's real, sir. Pierre's outbursts were familiar to Andre. He's wearing that beret, like, kind of str- Aren't you supposed to, like, tilt the ber Anyway, I'm not a fashion expert. Why did you put the executioner in position so soon? I didn't. Well, someone moved him here. Pierre, if I did move him, wouldn't there be footprints in the dirt? If I moved him, wouldn't there be footprints in the dirt? Did you walk him over? I feel like you would have picked him up. No, I don't know. Did you ever think you would become immortal, Mary? At this height look? Okay, the fact that you're talking to a wax figure is kind of creepy. Two, you're literally leaning your head into the guillotine. Oh god, oh god, I just hit me. What's gonna happen? It's just hit me. No, 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 no. And what was going through your head those last few moments? Oh my god, did he die? He didn't die. Oh my god. Someone is pulling a prank. What sick bastard would pull this kind of prank? Scare tactics level pranks, although I don't think they ever beheaded anybody. Congratulations, brother. Thank you. So then Pierre gets to open his wax museum and everybody loves it. Can you imagine how horrible that must have been to have your head chopped off? I know, right? I think it's kind of cool. What? Sir? I wonder what they did with all the heads. Very sensitive. A picture with your head in that guillotine. No, 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 no. Well, why me? What are you doing? You put your head in the thing, dude. It's a real blade. What the? Oh my god. Sorry, my commentary kind of goes downhill when I get this scared, but I am quite scared. <laughs> God, she's gonna die, she's gonna die, she's gonna die. And if she doesn't die, she needs to break up with her boyfriend. Hey, but it, it's not gonna work unless you look more scared. Hurry up! Chrissy! Oh my God, she was beheaded. Oh my God, oh my God, she still has her head. Oh, thank God. I was afraid there might be another accident, so I replaced the real blade with one made of balsa wood. Okay, I'm very glad she's okay. I'm very glad there was no accident, but someone needs to yell at them for messing around with that display. What the fuck? Don't do that. Now I suggest we would place the executioner. Did this story really happen? Oh, thank God nobody got beheaded. Oh, I thought... I mean, I know they wouldn't show... It's, it's a family-ish show beyond belief, but like, I thought we were gonna see some kind of beheading before the episode was over. Or was it merely overworked imaginations that made the two men begin to see things in their own exhibit? Maybe, I don't know. Will this story of the wax figure withstand the lasting test of truth? Or when all is said and done, will it simply melt away? I thought they were gonna make Jonathan Drake try to operate that guillotine, and I was like, I feel like that's going against union rules, don't do that. Next, a hospital becomes a bloody nightmare. Okay, so this is the story that got this entire episode requested. It's been requested several times since I started covering the show, and uh, if you're squeamish, you probably haven't made it this far. But a uh, fair warning, this one deals with a blood bank. I don't care for blood, so just thought people might want that warning. To many seriously ill people, these bags mean life itself. We really should make a bigger effort to do, like, I know there's, there's lots of people give blood and stuff, but we need to talk about giving blood more. I've only done it once and I feel kind of bad because I, like, totally, like, almost fainted and felt like a little bitch, but... The steady drip, drip, drip of these life-giving liquids 
provide the beat of life for patients in critical condition. Am I letting Jonathan Frakes guilt trip me into giving blood? I've been working the midnight to seven shift at St. Francis County for the past five years. Shout out to nurses. I know we just shouted out doctors and it's kind of all, all medical workers, all encompassing, but shout out to nurses. They're superheroes. But now only 24 hours later, his vitals were remarkably up. So this lady is treating this patient. He seems rather pale. I don't know if I've ever told this story before, but one time I was standing in, or I was photo doubling on a, um, like a medical drama show. And I was doubling for this kid who had been like, he was, you know, being rushed into surgery and he had lost all this blood. And so like, they needed him to look really pale and they looked at me and they were like, oh wow, we don't even really have to put you through makeup to make you look pale. You look great. And I was like, I look like I lost the majority of my blood. And they're like, you look great. And they were so happy. And I was glad that they were happy, but I was so sad. The following night I was on my rounds when I thought I heard voices coming from inside room 621. Don't like that. Don't like hearing random voices at two in the morning. It was two in the morning long past visiting hours. So she goes into her patient's room and there's this old couple dressed in black and they're like, yeah, we're visiting. Like you do at two in the morning. We are here to see Eric. This isn't abnormal at all. Please give us some time alone. So she's like, all right, I saw nothing. Have fun with your maybe grandparents. I don't know what the relation is, but all right. So now I knew the John Doe's name, Eric Creighton. Wait, so he was a John Doe until right now? Was he just withholding his name just for funsies? What the hell? And what was that creepy old man doing in the bathroom? What a strange sentence. Excuse me, excuse me? So she sees the couple hauling some very conspicuous looking bags into the elevator after them and she's like, something is wrong. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's actually scared the shit out of me. I was just looking for dirty guns. They've already been picked up. Nurses don't get paid enough anyway, but this lady's really not getting paid enough. Now please leave my room. Why is he talking like Batman? Somebody ripped off 200 bags of plasma from the blood bank. So the next night her um, co-worker is like, hey, someone ripped off 200 bags of plasma from us. Weird, right? Take 621 down to x-ray and keep him there a while. So she sends the patient to an x-ray that he doesn't need, which is probably unethical, but she does need to get to the bottom of this. Oh my god. And she goes into the bathroom and oh my god, that is a lot of blood. Ketchup, it's ketchup. It's gonna, it, this video is gonna be uh, demonetized for multiple reasons. It's, I just keep having, having to remind myself. It's a lost cause at this point. <laughs> I told you to stay away! And then, uh-oh, the creepy patient comes back, uh, pushing the nurse that was just pushing him in the wheelchair a second ago. He's now in the wheelchair, the nurse, and he's got fang marks in his neck. What did you do to him? So we know where this is going now. So she runs away from him, and then he, uh, vampire transports himself and catches her. <laughs> Vampire stealing from blood bank? Sure, why not? I always say that Dragon Con should have all the like phlebotomists taking blood at the at the blood drive they do there, dressing up as like different vampires from different IPs because it's Dragon Con. But anyway. <laughs> right before she gets bitten, the security guard comes in to do security guard things. <laughs> And oh, thank God, I thought he was about to get bitten instead and then she'd have to have that on her conscience, but it turns out uh, he just uh, pushes the security guard aside and yeets himself out the window. Hospital officials kept my story a secret. They didn't want their hospital associated with vampires. Yeah, I would say that, that in general, hospitals don't like to be uh, associated with vampires. Although vampires probably need medical care too. Maybe Eric wasn't a vampire. Maybe his goal all along was to steal blood and sell it illegally. See, that feels like they're trying to throw us a bone of plausibility because they know how ridiculous this sounds. By pretending to be a vampire, he knew his crime would go unreported. It's like, oh, maybe it was all just a cover so that you know, if he said it, he was a vampire, then he knew that we'd cover this up for him, which seems like a bad plan, but I don't know. It sounds like they're hedging because they're like, we know this sounds batshit crazy. Did the patient at room 621 
really need to drink blood to survive? Yeah, ask uh, Megan Fox and MGK. They're apparently into that. Is this vampire tale based on an actual event? Or are we just trying to suck you in? You think a vampire pun is gonna make this better, Jonathan? I'm traumatized. Next, a deadly game of chance on Beyond Belief. All right, one more story, one more story, and then we can figure out which of these stories they're trying to pass off as bullshit. In the heyday of the touring carnivals, prize booths were big money makers for the Barkers on the Midway. Has anybody actually won anything at a carnival? I never have, but maybe that's just because I suck. Like, I've kind of figured they were always rigged. The closest I've ever come to winning anything in my life was a few weeks ago I was at Pont City Market up on the roof playing ski ball, and like, you need like 400 points to win something at ski ball, and I got 390, and I was so sad. Big Ralph Zabriskie ran a crooked booth at a carnival for 20 years. But as Ralph is about to learn, no matter how skilled the con man, you can't cheat fate. So Jonathan Franks is like, this guy was a dishonest piece of scum. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about him. Big Ralph's traveling carnival looked like a place devoted to fun. Traveling carnivals are also kind of a big fear for me because like, I love theme park rides and stuff, but like the ones that have to be taken apart and then moved and put back together, I'm always worried that they're not structurally sound. Maybe I'm just uneducated in the whole world of traveling carnivals. He spent his time running the carnival and cheating little children. So this guy is cheating children out of their money by running these games. Classy. Another dollar, another ring, another chance. What do you say? I was about to say that I'm not going to bother making the connection between uh, something like this and people like, you know, the Paul Brothers or J Station, rest in piss to that channel. You know, those, those channels that would kind of prey on children by targeting their content to them and then being like, please buy our merch. I was about to say that I'm not gonna, you know, take the bait and um, make a connection between those two things, but I kind of just did, so what are you gonna do? In the next few moments, Big Ralph's luck and his entire future are about to change forever. But then one day this older guy shows up and just starts killing it, wiping the floor with everybody on the ring toss. How did you do that, Pop? Guess I'm just lucky. Okay, one, you need to, if you're gonna sell it more, you need to at least not be so outwardly shocked when somebody actually wins one of your games. Two, probably just really good at ring toss. You ever met an old person? They've all got like certain things that they're like superhuman at because they've been doing the same thing for like 70 to 80 years. Which one do you want? The bunny. I'll take the bunny. So this guy just keeps winning over and over and over and gifting uh, stuffed animals to all the kids who have been trying and failing to win all day. Bless him. The old master swindler was beginning to feel he was being swindled himself. You think Big Ralph would have cut him off like when you win too much money at a casino. All right, that's it. This booth is closed for repairs. Yeah, there it is. What kind of game are you playing, old man? Ring toss. Ring toss. That's what I thought we were playing the whole time. Also, just the image of this dude being, like, so angry with the happy carnival music in the background. Very funny. Again, maybe I've told this story before, but I have, like, this core memory. One time, I, it was, I was, like, in high school, and I had the flu. And so I was up all night, just, like, throwing up. I know, gross. And my mom had put on Cartoon Network for me just to try to keep my mind off of things, like, when I was a kid, to try to cheer me up. And <laughs> so it's, like, the middle of the night... I'm sitting on my couch, throwing up, and all of a sudden you hear the Smurfs come on, and it's like cha da 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 in the background, and it's like, I will never forget that. I think about that every time I see the Smurfs. You hustle me, you old bag of bones. Whoa, hey, don't insult and then beat up the old guy. I mean, he keeps calling him old man, and I, I don't know, is it? It almost feels disrespectful to call people old. Old, older, older guy. Who are you, old man? Just a harmless old man. Who are you, old man? Just an old man. You own that, sir. <laughs> hey, Big Ralph. <laughs> so the guy crushes his glasses like the supreme asshole that he is, and then like a baller, this older guy just like takes another pair of glasses out of his pocket and is like, hey, asshole, joke's on you, I have more than one pair of glasses. You got a car off track inside. Everything's going wrong today. So then, um, one of the carnival rides breaks down and, you know, Big Ralph is all upset and has to go fix it. Ow! 
cool. You ever have like little bits of songs get stuck in your head? I had that going the other day. It was uh, the song She Wolf by Shakira, but just the part where she's like, da 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 ah, <laughs> And it was just that on repeat in my head. <laughs> he then gets scared by one of his own dummies, like an actual dummy. I'm not saying something rude about a person. Ne never mind. I like how even in an apparent emergency situation, she still uses the Big Ralph <laughs> title. What's going on? Sonia, <laughs> stop playing with the sounds! So, this is getting progressively worse for Big Ralph. And then his co-workers all run in, and what do they find? This is also pretty gruesome. This whole episode has been pretty gruesome. <laughs> oh my god. Yep, they find uh, Big Ralph on alive, tied to the wall, and plot twist. <laughs> and so the old man had the last laugh on Big Ralph. The old man was an animatronic from the ride come to life. Who was now hanged to death by the hoop from the game of ring toss. Damn, that is brutal. That dude was not fucking around. Who was the mysterious old man? Was he some spirit sent to avenge the wrongful deeds of Big Ralph? Maybe. Maybe there was no old man. Maybe there was no Big Ralph. I never know what to trust on this show. Is this tale of the deadly game of ring toss inspired by an actual event? Or have we rigged the game once again? I feel like the odds of guessing correctly on this show are only slightly higher than winning at a carnival. Next, you'll find out which of our stories are fact and which are fiction. All right, we've heard all five stories for tonight. Is it night when you're watching this? It's night when it went up. I just let me know. But anyway, now we get to guess which ones are real and which ones are false. And I, um, if you've seen other videos that I've done about this, you know that I purposefully don't watch or at least don't watch the ending um, because I want to uh, guess with you guys. So, you know, let me know how you do in the comments. The story of the young girl who swallowed a fertilized octopus egg and grew the creature inside her body. This one feels like they really want us to think it's plausible, but this feels like just an urban legend that I've heard. Like, I, my brain almost feels like, oh yeah, I've heard that that happened before, but I think I'm just thinking of, like, somebody telling me about this urban legend. I don't think this is real. Do you think you've heard a story like this somewhere? Is it true? Only in the world of urban legends. Told you! I told you! Although this one has been circulated as true, it's fiction. They were trying to be too sciencey, and I was like, ah, uh, something's not right here, Beyond Belief. Now let's look at the house with the curse on it. Very generic for Beyond Belief, the house with the curse on it. I finally learned from the neighbors about the curse of Hampton Manor. I mean, I'm gonna say true, because Jonathan Frank said, basically he told us that it was real, right? He said, oh, well we changed the name, but the, the manor is real, it's called this, actually. So like, unless that was just like a massive red herring, I think this one is true. Although we changed the name of the house, this story was inspired by an actual event. All right, yeah, so that one was real. He did give away the ending early on. The story of the wax museum with the deadly exhibit. I think this one's false just because they seem to not care about this segment at all. Just like, ah, we have to write stuff? Ah, just throw something together. This one happened in a wax museum in Canada. Our source material spots it around three decades ago. Fuck, I thought I was turning a corner and getting better at guessing on the show. Sorry, I didn't mean to yell, I just, very passionate about this. Let's review the story of the hospital with the bloodthirsty patient. Again, this feels so fantastical and it feels like they threw us, um, like a bone with the whole, like, maybe they were lying about being vampires to try to, like, make it sound more plausible, so I think this one's false. Our research shows this story happened to a registered nurse on the East Coast about 20 years ago. It's fact. God damn it. That's terrifying. What about the cheating carnival barker who met an ironic fate in his own funhouse? I'm gonna guess false. I, I'm just gonna keep, I don't think they do that many true stories in the same episode. Although I can't remember. They might have done that many in an episode that we covered. I feel like I've said that before, but I've been guessing false. So I'm just gonna guess false again. I'm already two for four. So like, what do I have to lose? There's a common belief that carnivals employ people with shady or questionable backgrounds. But not this time. We made it up. Did Jonathan Frakes just try to dismantle uh, bigotry against carnival workers? Right on, Jonathan Frakes. I'm sure carnival workers are lovely people. Or, I'm sure the ratio of lovely people and assholes is exactly the same as any other part of life. 
Were you able to separate fact from fiction tonight? Nope. Or did you find our conclusions simply beyond belief? Yep. I'm Jonathan Franks. All right, and that's the end of the episode. I love returning to the show because everybody else loves this show. I love seeing you guys be just as confused as I am in the comments, so I'm very excited to get this episode out to you guys. Um, I know there's going to come a day, and it's going to be way in the future, but one of these days I'm going to have finally been able to say that I covered all episodes, all 46 of them, on this channel, and that's going to be like the end of an era for this channel. Like, this has been a staple of the channel for almost as long as the channel has been around, so I'm sure I will come back to this show again sooner than later, but I'm going to end this video here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing. Everything you do to support this channel means the world to me. Um, if you're new here and you're a fan of nonsense, maybe consider sticking around because I post nonsense all the time. And remember, my name is Avery. I'm a YouTuber if you say so because thanks to you guys, this is technically a YouTube channel. Bye! I don't have a cool exit like Jonathan Frakes. That guy has so much swagger.